Our guest today is the mayor of Aurora, Illinois, the state's second largest city with a population of nearly 200,000 people. He is serving his third term as mayor. Our guest today is the chairman of the Chicago Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, which has 272 mayors as part of that caucus. He is an active participant in the Pension Fairness for Illinois Communities Coalition, which you will hear more about today. Our guest today was appointed as a director of the Illinois State Toll Highway Authority by Governor Pat Quinn. You know, I just realized, I forgot to introduce Jack Lavin. Jack, where are you? Stand up. Jack Lavin, who does more for children and adults with special needs than anyone. I am so sorry. You don't mind, do you, Mayor? This is all on video tonight. You can show your family that. Sorry. Jack, I apologize. Anyway, prior to his uh, elected public service, he and his wife, Marilyn, who is here today, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> And Marilyn runs the largest food pantry in Aurora, and that deserves a second round of applause. But our guest today and his wife served in the Peace Corps, assisting rainforest dwellers in the highlands of Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. Ladies and gentlemen, Mayor Tom Weisner. Mayor? <clears throat> Thank you, Jay, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, you know, it's really nice to see so many of my fellow mayors here and so many people that I've uh, gotten to know uh, as mayor, in some cases even before that. So that is, it's a real pleasure to see you all. You know, when I was told I was invited here by the uh, City Club due to the recent phenomenon uh, sweeping this city in which literally Tens of tens of Chicagoans have been asking themselves on an almost daily basis, what, if anything, is going on in Aurora? <laughs> <clears throat> well, friends, if you're members of that growing multitude, and I can only assume that you are, I'm here today to answer your burning question, what is going on in Aurora? Let me uh, preface my remarks, though, by saying how much I love Chicago, and that as chairman of the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, I fully realize that Aurora's future and that of the suburbs is inextricably tied to the future of Chicago. Understanding that strong connection, I also want to take some time a bit later to discuss the public safety pension crisis, which today threatens the physical well-being of Chicago, the suburbs, and all of Illinois. You know, Chicago is often referred to nationally as the second city, but I want to spend some time talking a little bit about Illinois' second city, Aurora. And that's where I've served as mayor for almost nine and a half years now. And while many Chicagoans may think that Aurora is located somewhere the other side of Vladivostok, we're actually just 35 miles due west of your city. And with a population of 200,000, Aurora has been one of Illinois' fastest growing cities over the past three decades, expanding by 55,000 residents in just the last census period, a nearly 40% increase. Originally a railroad town like Chicago, our heavy industrial manufacturing base was decimated in the 70s and 80s, causing us to diversify our economy. As in most larger cities, the housing and banking collapses and in the ensuing recession of recent years have been very challenging for Aurora. We responded by reducing our workforce, by restructuring, and by privatizing to become more efficient. We continue to hold AA ratings on our general obligation bonds as well as our water fund bonds. Emerging from the Great Recession and solid financial condition, Aurora is now moving ahead on several fronts. We're overcoming a long-held reputation as a city with a major gang, crime, drug, and violence problem. By taking a comprehensive community approach, by working closely with federal law enforcement agencies, 
And by providing our pol police with uh, state-of-the-art tools and technology, Aurora has indeed turned the tide on crime. Homicides have fallen from 26 in 2002 to zero in 2012 and only three in 2013. The past six years have seen average annual crime numbers dramatically reduced when compared to the previous 10 years. Aurora has witnessed an 84% reduction in average annual homicides, a 69% reduction in shooting incidents, a 51% reduction in robberies, and a 56% reduction in burglaries. And the graph on the screen behind me here shows the overall reduction in part one crimes, or as we call it, major crime, uh, that includes homicides, robberies, rape, aggravated battery, etc., cetera, uh, from the period of 1988 through 2013. The orange line represents the reduction in the actual number of major crimes. The blue line shows an even steeper decline when we consider major crimes per capita, or in this case, per 100,000 population. So you can see there's been quite a drop uh, over a period of time. Such a drop, in fact, that earlier this year, based on research by a national real estate firm, Aurora was named as one of the 10 safest mid-sized cities in America. <laughs> the overall safety of our community has helped us to make new progress on many fronts. Chicago Premium Outlet Mall, on I-88 in Aurora is in the midst of a 60% expansion to nearly three quarters of a million square feet, 50 new stores, and 500 new jobs. Speaking of jobs, Aurora has them. Our 6.5% July unemployment rate compares well with other Illinois cities, beats the statewide rate, and is on track with the national rate. Aurora's new riverfront music venue, River Edge Park, which opened just last year, has featured the likes of Lady Antebellum, Buddy Guy, Idina Menzel, and Boston, just to name a few. Previously a brownfield site on the beautiful Fox River, River Edge Park is only 200 yards from the Aurora Metro Station, making it easily accessible to points east, including Chicago. <laughs> only three blocks from Metro, is the beautifully restored Paramount Theater, a 1931-built Art Deco theater in the heart of Aurora's downtown. Our locally produced Broadway series, in fact, was so, uh, created such an impression on Chicago theater critics, Chris Jones and Heidi Weiss, that they successfully lobbied uh, to allow the Paramount to compete in Chicago's prestigious Jeff Awards. Now in its fourth year, Attendance is up from 75,000 in 2011 to an anticipated 300,000 theater goers this year. In the area of technology, our 60-mile city-built fiber network allows us to provide bandwidth to, the city, to city facilities as well as the Illinois Math and Science Academy, to local schools, and to private businesses like the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, Bite Grid, and Rush Copley Hospital. And just two weeks ago, Aurora University opened its cutting edge STEM Academy, serving Aurora students grades three through eight and training Aurora teachers in the STEM curriculum. We're greening up Aurora with LEED certified buildings and with downtown and neighborhood rain gardens, beautifying Aurora and replacing more costly gray stormwater infrastructure. And we're cleaning up our riverfront, riverfront which goes through, right through the middle of our downtown and which is our own magnificent mile, I'd say. We've managed to make all this progress while reducing property taxes that support city operations, that is, other than public safety pension payments, to the lowest level in 10 years. I mentioned public safety pensions because they are paid for by local taxpayers, <coughs> increased at the whim of our local legislators, and are about to create a statewide financial crisis. The first crisis could occur right here in Chicago, which has its own police and fire pension systems as early as next year. For the suburbs and downstate, it's only a matter of time, and not much time at that. Aurora's police and fire pension payments amounted to $9.9 .9 million in 2005. In 2015, the payment will jump to 17.5, <clears throat> excuse me, the allergies are getting me here, uh, will jump to 17.5 million a 77% increase. 
by 2025, just another 10 years down the road, the payment will double to $35 million. And in 25 years, it will have quadrupled to almost $70 million. Now, police and fire unions will say that public safety pensions are a problem only because cities have not paid into them as they should have. And that might be partially true in some instances, but not in Aurora. As recently as 1995, our police and fire pensions were funded at 80% and 85% respectively, and we've paid the full actuarially determined contribution every year that I've controlled the budget as mayor. Yet due to poor investment returns and constantly increasing benefits, our police and fire pensions are now funded at only about 52% and 54% respectively. So despite the artful cries of union leaders, the supposed failure to fund is not the primary problem in most cities outside of Chicago. The primary problem is that, uh, that is destroying the physical health of communities all across Illinois is the constant public safety pension enhancements enacted on almost a yearly basis by our Illinois legislature. Let's take a look at exactly how these legislative enhancements have impacted police and fire pensions in Aurora and our property taxpayers as well. We took the average age and years of service of the last three retirees in each of four fire department ranks, private, lieutenant, captain, and battalion chief. We then figured what, what the average total pension benefit would be for each of the four ranks using an actuarial life expectancy of firemen, who are almost invariably men, at least in Aurora, uh, as well as that as a female spouse who gets survivor be benefits. And we generously assume that the couple got married at the same age. Life expectancy is now age 83 for men and age 88 for women, which means that with the average department retirement age of 54, many retired firefighters will receive pension benefits over many more years than they actually have worked. With these assumptions, the slide on the screen will show uh, what the total average fire pension benefit payout will be for each of the four ranks. First, you'll see what the total benefit would be if the legislature had more or less left the original pension formula alone. And you can see for a private, the total benefit is 1.8 some million, lieutenant 2.4 approximately, captain uh, 2.9, and battalion chief uh, a bit over uh, 3 million, a lifetime benefit. Next, however, we're gonna see uh, what that benefit will be uh, if only the early enhancements, which is basically an increase in COLA from 2% to 3%, uh, what impact that has. And we can see it's a relatively small impact, but not insignificant. And the last column will show uh, what, uh, what we're really currently faced with, given uh, the uh, improvements that have been made over uh, just the last 10 or 15 years, including a bump from a 3% COLA to a 3% compounded COLA, uh, a spouse or successor pension of 100% of what the uh, husband had, as well as several other uh, favors bestowed on our police and fire unions by an eager to please uh, legislature. So if you look at these numbers, uh, that you can see that legislative enhancements have in fact increased Aurora's uh, fire pension benefits by 56 to 75 percent. And none of us would begrudge, I think, a generous pension to public servants who often risk their lives in line of duty. I firmly believe that police and firemen deserve a more generous pension than the rest of us, without question. But the Illinois legislature has gone beyond providing generous benefits providing totally unsustainable benefits as of up to $5.4 million for a single fire fire pension, a price well beyond what local property taxpayers from any community can afford to pay. It's time, I believe, for the Illinois legislature to reform the irrational public safety pension systems it's created. Uh, it's time, once again, to make these pensions sustainable so that today's firemen and police officers can be assured that when they retire, they'll actually have a pension. And it's time, I believe, to relieve the undue pressure on local property taxes 
so that when communities, uh, so that community can basically can pay for uh, pensions of retired police officers and afford to hire new police officers at the same time. This means that the 660 downstate pension boards with 3,300 trustees should be consolidated into one centralized administration like IMRF, which showed a 20% return on investment in 2013. But this alone won't turn the tide, a tide that is actually a financial tsunami on the near horizon. Reasonable benefits and benefit reforms uh, are also required to keep public safety pensions sustainable in the near and distant future. It's time for the Illinois General Assembly, mayors and village managers, and our public safety unions as well uh, to work together to fix this problem. And it's time for property taxpayers across the state to insist that we do. Thank you for having me with you today. Uh, and assuming we have some time, I was much briefer than usual. I don't know what it, uh, we, uh, we could take some questions. Yeah, there's uh, my fellow mayors going out. Yeah. Okay, my question is, who is going to, be, well, other than uh, Pope Francis, who is going to consolidate all these pension boards when Illinois has more local governments than the nation of France? How are we going to consolidate just pension boards? Uh, who's going to do it? How's they going to do it? And are you volunteering? <laughs> Uh, well, you know, I'm certainly uh, willing to be part of the effort. There's no question about that. Uh, and for an elected official to be part of that effort is certainly taking your political life in your own hands. But uh, I'm up there near retirement age, so I can go whenever I want. So I, I'm, I'm kind of free to do uh, as I please. But uh, I think it's, it really is a matter of just common sense that when you have 660 uh, different pension boards, many of them small towns, who have neither, you know, do not have the uh, resources to make intelligent or uh, wise investments, uh, that uh, the dollars that they have to invest uh, don't reach a critical uh, level uh, to optimize the benefit, that bringing those pensions together, like IMRF, uh, for the rest of city workers or municipal workers, that's been in place for some time. There's a, they deal with a large sum of money because it's statewide. They have the best of advice. And as I said, uh, just in 2013, we had a 20% return on investment. I look at uh, Aurora and our own pension uh, board, which is, uh, represents, again, a city of 200,000, so we're not small. Uh, and the, in, I think the return on investment over the last 15 years was somewhere in the neighborhood of 5.7%. So. Part of the problem, I would think, that firemen and policemen and their unions would be crying out for that kind of consolidation so that they could actually get, uh, they could optimize the benefit of the dollars that go into the fund. The problem is that the state, the way it's set up right now, is you have a three to two majority on each of these boards that are union members. Uh, they can do what they will, and in the final analysis, no matter how poorly those investments perform, the local community has the responsibility to make up the difference uh, and to fully fund those pensions. So that's a little bit of the problem. But I would think that other states who have managed this much better than we have could serve as models to uh, making sure that we optimize return on investment and have a pension fund where we're not worried about whether or not cities are going to go broke in the next 10 years and we're not worried about whether there'll even be a pension for police and firemen who retire 15 years from now. Okay. By the way, that answer was longer than his speech. Okay. Uh, you got to walk carefully on this consolidation. Uh, from uh, Dr. Paula Wolf, uh, please discuss how crime was reduced in the face of gang issues in your city of Aurora. Well, it's hard to attribute to, to one thing. Really, there's several uh, issues there. Number one, uh, we have a, a very good police force uh, in Aurora, very active. Uh, one of the first things I did was to get the community behind replacing the antiquated police department that literally had 
water dripping on computer uh, equipment, et cetera, and to uh, fill that department with uh, the latest technology and tools to help them perform better. We also, I had the, uh, the benefit of, of meeting uh, with the Franklin Covey folks who were at AU, uh, I think the first week uh, after I was elected, and uh, they indicated, uh, Stephen Covey, indicated that he was uh, interested in perhaps branching out into working with the public sector as well as the private sector as he had for some time. And I said, I'm very interested uh, in working with you. And so we worked together, and one of the things that came out of that was that when we set goals for the community, every division and department had to go back. Our number one goal was reduction of crime in the community. Every department, division in the city had to come back a goal and develop goals around, uh, uh, action steps around those uh, goals so that the entire city, every department was involved in working towards crime reduction. An example of that would be street lights in our older neighborhoods, uh, the old uh, broken window thing where if an area looks like crime can happen, it will. Very true, very proven. We started fixing street lights instead of the typical municipal uh, lazy fair attitude or whatever, uh, we started fixing those street lights within 48 hours. We started uh, uh, eradicating graffiti within 24 hours. Those are just a couple of examples. But every city in our department had a role to play. And I think that had an impact, a strong impact. Our neighbor, we worked very hard with our neighborhood organizations uh, and very closely with them. And last but not least, we worked very closely with several federal agencies, uh, who all of whom had different types of powers, but when combined in one effort, uh, really, really brought to bear uh, some of the best uh, crime solving possibilities that we could. So in the end, we put a huge number of gang leaders in jail for one or offense or another, and they were put in jail on federal charges, not state charges. If you get a 20-year term in the state, you serve maybe seven. If you get a 20-year term in the uh, federal term, you serve 19 out of those 20 years. And so when these so-called gentlemen were confronted with uh, that much time in prison, they began to talk. And we were able then to take that information, arrest a whole new uh, group of underlings, uh, and charge them on federal crime. So in a series of... Uh, that process going around two or three times, uh, we, t we really decimated the leadership of the gangs uh, in Aurora, and it's had a huge impact. Nonetheless, you know, we've had a couple uh, incidents of vi violence by gangs in recent weeks. So you can never stop, you can never give up, you can never let up. But we are way ahead of where we were uh, 15 years ago or 20 years ago. So. Two more, we have two more questions. and. Okay. Mary Sue Barrett, raise your hand. Oh, you already got MPC. Well, this fits right in. What additional tools do mayors need from DC and Springfield to fix the aging infrastructure needed to spark economic development? Well, I think one of the, one of the best kept secrets in Illinois, uh, especially among older towns, and it doesn't mean just large older towns like Aurora, but smaller uh, towns that have been around for 150 years or whatever, uh, is the terrible aging of their uh, uh, basically potable water infrastructure, water mains, et cetera. And uh, recently, IEPA has been looking at, at the prodding of MPC, uh, CMAP and others, uh, has been looking at their revolving loan fund, in which they have a huge amount of dollars, which generally go largely untapped, uh, to be able to broaden the horizon of the possible uses of those dollars, whether it be for engineering, water main improvements, and hopefully uh, going forward to actually fund that. Now it's a loan program with very low interest, uh, but it can be valuable if the, uh, the other thing that MPC is working with IEPA on is facilitating or, or what I say, streamlining the process to avail oneself of those loans which has been somewhat arduous process in the past and has really been the cause of uh, a lesser use of those funds than might otherwise occur. So uh, the work, and I'm glad I had this opportunity because I want to say that without the work of CMAP, the, uh, without the work of MPC, um, 
you know, Aurora would not be where it is today. And we really appreciate the effort that's made it, uh, by them to make sure that we're well served. But that's an example of how we could uh, make inroads on infrastructure needs. By the way, if you don't know your acronyms, you're in trouble. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Of course, we all know what they mean. Last question from Board Member Joyce Saxon. This will be a short question, and I assume it will be a somewhat short answer. Did you curtail gun sales? Uh, no, that, that is not uh, taking place. Although um, there were some laws passed several years ago dealing with uh, assault weapons or whatever, but I don't think we've come across huge problems with that. But in terms of curtail uh, curtailing gun sales, the only thing I can say, and I and I'm believe me, I'm not uh, suggesting that the <coughs> excuse me proliferation of guns is a great thing for our society. I don't think I go there. Uh, nonetheless, I will say that the progress that we have made in Aurora is despite the fact that there aren't uh, any more controls on typical handguns and things than there are uh, uh, in, a, in other communities. So I don't think that putting all your chips in that direction uh, is really going to solve the crime gang violence problem in and of itself. Uh, and I think we're an example of someone, of a community that did that uh, without that being a key instrument in the process. Now, that being said, am I a believer that we should all have guns and we should all be able to walk into schools and restaurants and places like that that I think Georgia uh, either instituted or was trying to institute? Uh, no. I, I don't think that's a good thing. Okay, how about a round of applause? We got some